Greetings, friends, wherever you are. Friday, 31st of May. I am broadcasting from Bucharest in Romania and very happy today. Um, the 35th Lazarus Symposium, no less, uh, to reintroduce um, a rock star lineup of our symposium uh, icons. And I'm going to jump straight into it with little uh, fuss today. Um, firstly, I want to bring back. Shanaz Sony, who you've been screaming for for the last few weeks. Shanaz, very <laughs> happy to see you again. Thank you for Thank joining. Thank you, Sasha, for bringing me to this gathering again. I'm so excited to see all of you guys. It's been a while. I haven't met, I haven't done anything with you. So I'm happy to um, have that convergence again. Thank you. Well, you're looking, you're looking very, very well, I have to say. I don't, whatever you've been doing, keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, friends, next up. Um, I'm going to start with veteran status, and that would mean David Sarita. <laughs> David, good to see you. Oh, David is muted as usual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was just saying, I'm a veteran. I guess I am. Uh, <laughs> I fought in a lot of wars. Uh, right, indeed, indeed. And, and they're not over yet, I'm afraid to say. No. And today, today's discussion is definitely going to uh, underscore the fact that we still have um, a few celestial obstacles and, uh, and what have you to navigate in this great shift of ages. Let me bring on next, Dave Emery. Happy to see you, brother. Oh, great to be here. I'm so, so pleased to be with Shanaz, David and Alex. I'm going to learn such a lot. I've got my notebooks here ready to scribble <laughs> down all their words. Thank Good you. Good man. Ex exactly right. And Dr. Alex Ling, of course. Alex, happy to see you. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Sasha, for having me again. And uh, yes, what a, a so much, a, so much to say today. There's so much information. I'm looking forward to this one. Very good. So um, I'm in Bucharest. Dave, where are you? Dave Emery, where are you? I'm in UK. Whereabouts? In the south of England, just north of Southampton. Very good. Shanaz? Huntsville, a rocket city, Alabama. Very United good. States of America, of course. <laughs> Dave, David Sarita is in Kanata. Yeah, I'm in Canada. I'm just north of Idaho. If you just cross the Idaho border, I'm right there standing on the border. Very good. Does that mean the Emperor Trudeau rules over you? Nobody rules over me. <laughs> Only God, the infinite, infinite, supreme being. <laughs> Very good. And Dr. Alex, uh, where are you? I'm in Cornwall, uh, just near St. Ice, actually, in Port Treith, right at the coast. Not so sunny today, but uh, still beautiful. Very good. And I'll be joining you. I'll be joining you um, later. The, I think the end of June, I'll end be of, in the UK, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, Ireland, and elsewhere. And uh, you and I are doing two or three uh, stints, uh, theater stints together, which I'm greatly looking forward to. Yes, me too. Very much so. Very good. So, friends, um, a brief background on uh, my distinguished speakers. Dr. Alex Ling is the researcher known for his pioneering work in integrating ancient wisdom with modern scientific practices. Um, his background is extraordinary. I'm not going to go into it right now because we've done that in previous shows. Uh, but he has a very, um, very enigmatic pedigree, to say the very least. And what's most extraordinary about um, Alex is, to my mind, in any event, is how he is using very progressive uh, consciousness aspect connected to technology and innovation uh, in order to, um, and I hope I'm not being too previous speaking like this, Alex, uh, in front of you, but the way I see it with your extraordinary pedigree is you are undoing a lot of Babylonian um, knots, so to speak, that have been uh, cast. You're working in such a beautiful way with, with water, for instance, and we're going to speak a great length on that, and not only uh, on the tour, um, which, which I'll be doing in the UK, but also next month's Lazarus Symposium. I believe we're doing a very big a special focus on what you're doing with water. But is it fair to say that your work is somewhat undoing the B Babylonian knots? Yes, absolutely. Very true. Uh, because some of the uh, the codings which have been put into or the blueprints which they have been creating 14,000 or many, many years uh, 
ago. So in, in some area, in, in, in areas like Levant, which is home to the uh, Megiddo Mount and a very, very critical point there, uh, the, the ancient waters have been imprinted with this kind of energy for thousands and thousands of years and been sealed off literally from uh, the Sumerian kings so that nobody has access to it and can change those codings. Uh, there's just so much information, and that's why these areas are still uh, so uh, such conflict areas as well, because it's all about the water. So we are actually in contact at the moment with um, a large group in Tel Aviv. Uh, some of them are really well-known healers and also into water research. And uh, our plan is in October to travel to Tel Aviv and to the uh, Mount of Megiddo to change these codings. Um, and hopefully then it will make a change uh, in, in the uh, situation which is still occurring in, in that area. Did you, did you say November? Yeah, no, either October or November, so we're not quite sure. Very, I need to speak to you about that because I'm, I'm planning to be in Jerusalem, so it would be wonderful yeah. again to dovetail. And I've got some very key people in that part of the world who are, are taking me to see some extraordinary stuff as well. So let, let, let's speak about that. Um, thank, thank you, Alex, for that. Um, Dave Emery is a highly regarded expert in the field of cosmic resonance and celebrated for his innovative research and contributions to understanding com complex interdimensional phenomena. Christ, I don't know who wrote that, uh, Dave. Um, that's not how I would have written. No disrespect <laughs> to you, Christy, but I don't know what the fuck that means. But uh, you all know Dave, I think, mostly for being an archaeocosmologist. At least I'm the one who puts that moniker onto, onto them. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, very happy to have you today. Um, and um, I'm going to just jump straight on to Shanaz, our uh, resident rocket scientist, spiritual practitioner, and lecturer, yeah. respected for her deep insights and ability to connect profound spiritual principles with practical applications. And of course, um, David Sarita, leading researcher and author in energy physics and consciousness studies, acclaimed for his interdisciplinary approach and significant contributions to the field. Um, underscore the field, because David's, um, David's acumen really extends from it, it's just full gamut alpha omega. I mean, just such an extraordinary uh, breadth and scope of, of acumen and experience from um, all things physics, all things uh, consciousness, and such a delight uh, to have you in our midst. David, I'd like you to, if you don't mind, um, really introduce the, the subject. Um, we're talking today about transcending uh, fear and skepticism uh, to navigate to the heart of cosmic awakening and global ascension against the backdrop of eclipses and solar flares and what have you. Uh, it, we're exploring really how these celestial events signal uh, a pivotal um, moment for humanity by delving into the interplay between solar flares, eclipses and geomagnetic storms using historical context and modern uh, scientific insight um, we're looking to uncover here how these cosmic forces influence uh, our ascension process. Essentially, that's what we're looking at. Speak to that. Yeah, I mean, if you were a surfer, and I, I used to be a surfer, I was a terrible surfer, but I loved wiping out on the waves in Malibu. But it, it, you just you just dive in. And when you think of this solar tsunami wave that hit us, it was an opportunity, and I'll demonstrate this here in a, in a share screen mode here, to really get super energized, actually. And um, this one here, this particular image here, um, is one of my favorite, because this happened on the 20th of May, and we had Venus behind the sun. Earth is where we're looking from, and we had... Jupiter coming into play, you'll notice right above at 12 o'clock are the Pleiades. And so this, this was after, so everything started approximately May the 9th, which on the lunar calendar is the Ascension Day of Jesus, but on the solar calendar, the Ascension Day of Jesus. And I, I want to, I want to preface here for a second. The, the Tibetans have 49 days where a person is processing after they died before they ascend. 
in, in, in this particular Christian model, there's 40 days. So you notice how close there, those are. So during the 40-day window, when Christ is appearing to the apostles, the in the anniversary of that for this year, which is approximately mid-May, we have the Pleiades every morning rising in the sun. In fact, when the solar flares started around the 9th of May, um, it was right over here at about, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And then on this 12 o'clock point, this blast created a literally a portal vortex between Earth, the Sun, Venus, and Pleiades. And that is really remarkable because that burst of energy created an incredible alignment. And during this period, in my inner circle, we've been doing the frequencies of the central Palladian star, which is Alcyon. And the experiences you have, like see, you can see some of these animated images of this huge far side a, a solar flare event. Now, when you when you realize what's happened, in fact, it was one of the most beautiful things, not coming from fear at all, that our solar so I want to say our solar heart center, solar plexus center, we all got this. We got this huge wave of energy. I'm going to show you a graphic from um, um, from uh, space weather itself that shows um, what was, was really, really happening. And that is um, uh, right here, except... Here we go. Let's go to my share screen. Share screen. And we go to here. And we go to here. Here it is. So this, this demonstrated that we are literally, th this graphic actually showed the rocks and soil electrified by the superstorm. And of can course, you, can you can you magnify that a bit by um, command plus because it's very very small. Yeah, uh, the be distinguishable. Is that working at all? I don't think it is. Not really. Well, really, it shows you a geological map of the United States. I'll just explain it to you. And all of the rocks in geology, which is crystal and water and all the, the 72 or more trace minerals you have in your body, the same thing happened. So we all got this supercharge. Mm. Now, what, when energy is that intense, it's kind of like Kundalini. When it, when it forces its way into the body, it looks for a block and it purges and it tries to purge that block like you release, you know, old plumbing or a clogged plumbing. Or, so you can have a reaction that you would interpret as negative, but it's actually purging, cleansing, purging, cleansing, right? So if a person is afraid of that huge burst of energy, because even in the Carrington event, you know, in I think it was in the, in the late 1800s, um, and this particular sunspot group was as big as the Carrington sunspot group, but it did not produce a Carrington, a Carrington level flare. If we look at our top 50 flares, I should actually pull that up. You'll see where these flares resided. Um, top 50 solar flares. Um, here they are from space weather. I can actually show everybody this. So you really see what we experienced was not, um, was not record-breaking. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think he committed suicide there involuntarily. <laughs> um, oh, dear. All right. Well, good. Let's jump on to the next question, which, well, to talk about ancient wisdom and solar events. Let's just explore momentarily the connection between solar events and historical magnetic fields extending from the Levant to Gobekli Tepe. Alex, um, how mm. have ancient civilizations interpreted and recorded solar events as catalysts for awakening consciousness? And what can we learn from their understanding about our current solar phenomenon? Well, the civilizations, for example, uh, near Gobekli Tepe, uh, actually, to be very precise, it was the Haranians, which were the most knowledgeable group of people who would be uh, very knowledgeable about the solar cycles. And they would also know exactly about the 11-year cycle, about the solar maximum and these kind of things as well. 
So they could forecast literally for the next uh, few thousands of years, you know, these kind of events to happen. And, uh, and it was, uh, there are two different scenarios here, which, which has to do with the solar activity. And I want to just really quickly explain that because it's quite important. So you have one solar cycle, which is quite uh, an ordinary cycle and nothing much really happens. But then you get uh, an event which uh, coincides with other events as well, which is, for example, a solar eclipse, which we just had. And, uh, and then to top it all up, we had also, we are in the middle of the solar maximum. So this solar maximum is actually quite different from all the others. And that only occurs any, any kind of time scale can reach between 11 and 14,000 years, which kind of matches with Gobekli Tepe and some of the forecasts which they have given in their carvings, for example. And that's, for example, also one of the pillars, 40, uh, pillar 43, which I believe has to do with this kind of event, this solar event. Um, so, and the, the difference is that usually the solar, um, uh, so that the pole is changing on the sun, uh, so which, which then induces the solar maximum. Uh, usually only affects one of, of the, the hemisphere, either the northern or the southern. But this time, it affects both of the hemispheres uh, at the same time. So and that's why we had globally this enormously beautiful auroras all around the, the world. So in ancient times, this was known to be the absolutely crucial, a, a very, very important point where we as humans can connect to... Uh, godly consciousness, if you like, but uh, we also know so far uh, that this consciousness was connected to water. So that's why all the pyramids and all the megalithic sites around the world are all connected to water. And it was literally there to supercharge us as humans and connect us back to this uh, uh, godly consciousness, which is water. Very so good. it's all in the water. So very just... Good. Very, very short. Uh, it's, it's a huge, complex kind of thing. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and uh, Shanaz, um, from a rocket scientist's point of view, what's the word on the street? What's the word on, on NASA Street, for instance, about the, the phenomenon that we're experiencing uh, in, you know, last year into this year and these kind of in incremental um, building kind of um, stepping stones toward what? Towards some event horizon. Clearly something is dialing up and it's all connected to the sun. Uh, what is the word on the street from within the scientific community dealing with the uh, outer space? So as far as like NASA goes, right, they really wanted to avail the solar eclipse that happened recently, right? So they actually launched rockets to kind of really understand what was happening uh, within the ionosphere to understand how they can enhance the communication, right? Especially with all the goals of colonizing Moon and Mars, right? So they were kind of more focused on how we can uh, advance our communication technology, right? That was the that was the focus from their perspective. Like when you really understand what's happening with aurora borealis that Dr. Alex mentioned, right? I mean, how the electron and proton from the sun is depositing in our medium, right? Because we have this medium between us and the sun and, and, and the earth. And that medium, when it has this higher content, right? Higher content uh, for storing information then what happens, it enhances all of our psychic abilities, right? It enhances all of us, uh, all of our abilities, right? So that we can actually become more aware of our existence with respect to everything around us. So this is of course my point of view that I'm saying, uh, Sasha. So, so as far as NASA goes, they're very much focused on leveraging all these things to enhance their devices, right? Because they already have communication device, but they wanna make it better. Uh, and they're, I mean, right now they're gonna use um, Neuralink, right? Elon Musk Neuralink for everything because we are actually no longer using Tedris, which was initially the goal. But now, since we have Neuralink, we're going to use that for all sorts of communication when we land on Moon and ultimately uh, what we do with Mars. So it's kind of interesting because it's a very Martian point of view when it comes to NASA, right? It's, it's like a very Martian mindset. I'm actually saying that I am uh, running into people who are saying that they are getting more visions now about where they come from or who they are. Like, like they are able to see what the connection they have with everything around them. And I think that that to me is the most amazing thing that, that's happening is that we are all 
kind of becoming more aware of our multidimensional existence, right? And we're also becoming aware that how we are interplaying in the universe, right? Because we are the you in the universe and that interplay that we have with each other is very important for us to understand because in the quantum field, you know, we're all connected and we're all affecting each other. And because of that interconnection, we can leverage it towards something that's beautiful, we could, but we can also take it where we have been going, right? In the past, in terms of the chaos, the confusion, the problems. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing that's happening. Uh, but one thing I also want to say is like uh, Dr. Alex mentioned that everything happens and you can extrapolate, right? Like for example, if all of these events are going to happen, nothing is going to happen in an instant, it's going to happen as a Jacob ladder building up in the process. And therefore, we are going to be converging and integrating as they are happening. And because of that, the transcendence, uh, Sasha, the word that you use, right, becomes extremely important for us to integrate our evolution as the sun is evolving and as the magnetic pole is moving, because this is kind of like more along the line of what Vedic astrology touches on, right? When the etheric content of the consciousness gets rich and it helps us to really um, tap into our highest potential. Right. But doesn't a micro nova event, for instance, happen instantaneously? There's no yes. increment. There's no dialing in. There's no it. increment. You're right. You're right. Because time does not exist in all dimensions. But the thing is that what I'm saying is that at least whatever is the perspective, right? It becomes a perspective again. Because when you really listen to Don Hoffman, right? Space and time is just a one channel among many channels we can dial in. But it, it is very interesting. Yes, so you're right about that. But it's one of those things where I've seen, like, you know, I mean, like in relationship, right? People are like, what? You don't like me? I thought you loved me. But yeah, I didn't like you for a very long time. But I got the balls to tell you in front of your face now. You see my point? <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, Dave, how, how do you imagine might the symbolism of the phoenix for instance, and other uh, ancient motifs help us understand uh, the interconnectedness of cosmic and earthly transformation and their role in collective awakening. <laughs> Phoenix is uh, certainly an interesting symbol. It's, uh, it's a symbol that was uh, created by the Anunnaki um, as an alternative uh, mechanism for revealing the expansion of life and process. Um, so it's really uh, what we might call an artificial symbol uh, implanted upon us. And that really uh, indicates that what we're all talking here so eloquently about, Alex about the water and the power of it, uh, David about uh, the effect upon our uh, own particle base and the Earth's particle base, and of course, Sasha's, uh, Shinaz's uh, wonderful uh, demonstration there of the connectivity of all of us. This is really fundamental to everything that we're talking about here. And, and that is the shift, the schism, the dichotomy that took place historically over tens of thousands of years. And so this is where we have modern day expansion of consciousness connected absolutely and completely with the historical developments which endeavoured to dumb us down and to prevent us from remembering the critical factor, as Shinaz indicated so brilliantly, the universe of you. We are the universe. Everything ticks around within us. We have all the commodities. We have all the connections for the whole of the universe. And so what we're really talking, and this is from my point of view, what we're really talking about is the schism that took place between what we know as to being true of ourselves as the universe, our consciousness, and the separation that we were encouraged to believe in, that we were none of those things. And this came through the last 15,000 years of our history, and it came right through the heart of Sumeria, and it was deliberately foisted upon us. The wonderful thing about this, uh, what's happening today, is as Shanaz says, we are awakening and it is absolutely impossible to stop. Well, Sasha, you're muted. Balls, I was just speaking to you actually. I was just saying you, you dropped out earlier. Um, yeah. and so we, we certainly got the gist of what you were saying, uh, but uh, please chime in 
uh, on the tail end of this um, this latest uh, uh, conversation. Today. Well, I'll show you. I did an experiment. I mean, I orchestrated an experiment the, um, in Russia, and I'll show you what we did. We we showed we took ordinary tap water, and this would be tap water from any city, and it was cryogenically flash frozen using the Masaru Emoto effect. And I was actually the distributor of, of the movie Water, the Great Mystery at this time. So I met Emoto and met the Russian researchers. And we exposed it to the actual sound recording of our son that NASA did, which is a compressed recording. And it restructured the water actually more beautifully than almost anything I've ever seen. And it did this consistently. And what really interests me next is when, when we actually took the measurements of the human chakra system using this GDV aura camera, we played the sound of the sun, which we, we do magnetically through my, my coil systems back here with subjects, people. And we found that the, the energy distribution in the body shifted and took most of the energy from all the chakras and expanded the heart. So the heart chakra expanded by the impetus of the sound waves of our sun. And I think those sound waves are actually more responsible for the nuclear fusion than anything we understand about nuclear fusion, actually. So the sun really is the, the heart activator, right? It's our heart thermally emits radiation that travels inversely at the speed of light and reaches the sun in eight minutes and 21 seconds. And the sun reaches us inversely in eight minutes and 21 seconds. So it seems that from the experiment we did, that the sound of the sun was really beneficial to the heart center and, and the awakening of the heart center. So I would deduct then that these solar flares, again, are very purging. So for people who are not heart centered, they're gonna get a huge burst and there's gonna be resistance and that there can even be heart attacks in massive solar flares. But the other thing I was going to show is to give a comparison model of what these particular flares really looked like compared to um, previous ones. And so I'll just show you the, the chart here, which is, um, here it is, right there. So you can see that the, 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 actually the Carrington event was a plus X40, and we had one of those in two. That's Ill illegible on, on our screen, just so you know. Oh, it's illegible. Yeah, it's so okay. small, it's indecipherable. Well, I can just basically tell you where our solar flares are that we just had for 2024 are going to be way down the list um, about... Um, I, I have I can't even see them yet. They're they're quite low on this list, and so what we we didn't set any records is what I'm saying. We we didn't um, we didn't set any records. Yeah. Um, the Carrington event was X40. I think we hit an X8 thereabout. Um, so an extreme category eight. Um, so it's not, but the size of the sunspot was equal to the Carrington sunspot, but the Carrington sunspot produced a way more powerful storm, like by far. So in a way, considering we're at solar maximum cycle and the sun is due to reverse its poles right now, and this can happen at any time. And Alex knows this. We're due because that's about every 11 to 12 years. And another interesting thing about the 12 year, 11 to 12 years is Jupiter will go around the sun in in that in a cycle of about 12 years i think it's just a little bit under so there there might be a synchronicity there to, to jupiter because jupiter also was paired with the sun and venus just in in the in the far end of the window that i demonstrated where this was happening so we had we had earth to sun to venus to pleiades and pleiades is now just a little bit around you know uh two o'clock and it's still quite close to the sun. So we still have this incredible Palladian alignment right now. So I, I think I see it more as a, it definitely wasn't devastating. Notice there were there were very few power interruptions. There were radio interruptions at around 25 to 30 megahertz, which we don't use for telecommunication much anymore. 
Right? Yeah. We're in the gigahertz bands. I see it more of a supercharging event and a purging, a cleansing, and, and a very big activation. Very good. Thank you. Um, on the on the side, just want to raise this question about um, our friend um, Terence Howard, who uh, made made a recent appearance on Joe Rogan's broadcast and um, is now being hailed as the Tesla of the twenty first century. Um, I'm just curious to know from this grouping of um, advanced scientific minds on this panel, um, does one times one uh, equals two, or does it not equals two? Alex, keen to, keen to know your thoughts there. Hmm. Yes, I have been following this a little bit, but I haven't had this, the time really to study it intensively. But um, yeah, very interesting concept with uh, the tables. Um, so, and I get where he's coming from, but I'm still a little bit in two, two camps about it. So yeah. that's yeah, that that's pretty much where I'm I, I'm at as well. I'm not I'm not uh, um I, not in agreement with him on on the magnetism bit. But Shanaz, yeah. what are your thoughts on Terence Howard? Yeah, so I agree with both of you guys because first of all, I actually looked at one of his books that's out there uh, freely available on the Google, and I noticed that there was a lot of similarity in actually uh, how I look at things because I have been researching Tesla and Walter Russell. And he's also using their, um, you know, like the flower of life, right? So everything that he shares about flower of life has been there for thousands of years, right? That's how yeah. King Solomon actually created all the uh, healing that they teach in the modern mystery school now, right? So a lot yeah. of things that he's bringing up has already been uh, availed and used by our ancestors and ancient wisdom, right? So it's not yeah. anything new. Um, the whole math thing that he's bringing up, which I did not dive much into it because part of me was very much like I was very surprised that like, you know, there's so many challenges we have in our educational system. To me, it's a foundational challenge. Having to get hung up on a map is not the right way to bring the change that I am envisioning that we need to bring in our, in our, in our earth. Right. It's a very, it's a very, it's a foundational change that we need to bring and to get hung up on an equation and to question the entire math. Yes. Kind of makes everybody kind of like, you're not helping because you want to bring, um, harmony, right? You don't want to bring more confusion. We yes. already have a lot of confusion, right? So to me, I didn't agree with that. The other thing I noticed that he mentions that he has 97 patterns. And, and to me, if somebody who has 97 patterns, I mean, if I have 97 patterns, I would be very busy implementing them, right? I mean, because there's a lot of work, you know how pattern works. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of things that he's sharing that we all agree on because we've already we are already aware of it because it's part of ancient wisdom and uh, it's not anything new. He's uh, getting more attention according to me. <laughs> right. Okay. So in a sense, it, in, in a sense, it's a kind of re reductivism is now being glorified. And I, I, I agree. I think that's foundationally dangerous roundabout now. I think it's divisive as well. It's also uh, seems to be symptomatic of the fact that um, people are generally quite stupid and need um, need a hero and need need to be I don't know it's just a, another form of iconoclasticism which I, I personally uh, I'm I'm over it. I, Dave, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on on the genius of Terence Howard? Genius uh, and very eloquent uh, speaker. I watched his um, video. I was fascinated. I'm not a scientist like all the rest of you here, and I never admit to being one. Um, so you people will know much more about the dynamics, the particle physics behind it all, and I respect that. Um, I, I, the only thing I will say is that um, I've been informed that there are 144 um, natural organic elements in the periodic table. Uh, when I was at school, it was 92. No doubt it's increased, etc. I don't know the facts of this. Um, the other thing is that I think that he has many of the attributes of an angelic indigo in the way that he yes. speaks. Yes. Uh, and so I resonate with that. However, let me just say also that all of us, millions of us have been angelic indigos. And yet we have still been confused by a lot of the information that we have been given, which we have been told is correct. And therefore, we must follow the rules according to the correct information. What I'm saying here is that as an angelic indigo, what's happening now is we are awakening and we're questioning. 
we're asking, is this right? Is that right? Does this feel good? Does this yeah. feel, does this suit me? And I will point out something here, and I'm going to throw a spanner into the works here, and I don't make any apology to it. For thousands of years, we have been told about sacred geometry, the platonic solids, the metatronic solids, um, the flower of life, and the Fibonacci spiral, the golden mean. All of these mathematical, geomantic, symbolic equations, they all work in a 3D yeah. world, but they are not the original infinite life formations of geomantic, symbolic energy sequences. They are simply not. There is an alternative, and it is the original. It's the original infinite flow of life. And all of those objects that uh, Terence Howard was talking about are straight out of the, uh, the, the the shifted emerald tablets of Toth, which he stole originally from the infinite versions of all of these and adapted them. They are finite systems. They are not infinite systems. So my view is, whether I'm right or wrong, is that I endorse people who ask questions, who say, I want to know the truth as I feel it and I'm open to suggestions. So with regard to Terence Howard, I thought he spoke very well, but I'm not a scientist. And so I can't verify whether he's telling the truth, but I can feel whether he's telling the truth about things like sacred geometry. And I don't believe he is. Right, very good. And, and uh, of course, the, the section we've got coming up later uh, in, the, in the symposium today, um, Dave, which you and I pre-recorded uh, with, um, with our friend um, George. Uh, George Leoniak, Crystal Spiral and the Geometry of Ascension. We sort of go into this, this subject um, in, in, greater, in greater detail. The departure from um, Fibonacci and from Pi, from Golden, Golden Section, and so on and so forth. Um, Dave, David, your, your um, thoughts on Terence Howard and the controversy thereabout? Well, I think um, the fact that he's getting so much attention is curious. But first of all, one times one is, a, is an agreement that it is one because it's one one. And if you change your agreement, see, math is like this human made grid that comes down on nature. From, and that nature can be the subatomic, you know, explosions and particles. It can be um, it can be the flowering of, of, of a a vortice. It can be natural uh, rhythms and patterns in nature. In fact, when I look for an exact golden ratio in nature, you don't actually find them. So that's an example. So if you agree the golden ratio is 1 to 1.618033987 and the decimals keep going, you should be able to find that in nature. In fact, when the human skull is measured from the bridge of the nose to the little soft spot to the back of the head, in, in humans, it, it ranges you know, 1 to 1 1.5758. And when you measure your primates and your, your dolphin brains and all the different brains, including lions, humans are, this was done actually at, um, at a major university. I've read the study. Um, we're the closest to, to an approximation of the golden ratio, but the golden ratio precisely doesn't really exist, not, not the way you would think it would. So going back to Terrence Howard, one times one is two. Well, you're changing the agreement, all right? Because math, math is the approximation of the natural world, including the quantum world, including the, the, you know, the world of physics. I mean, I, I took physics in my school days, and I worked for a legendary physicist. I wouldn't my particular mathematics, I really focus on calculating precise frequencies and the effects of those frequencies. I've got calculated thousands of frequencies. So when I look at Terence Howard, I'm like, okay, there's no straight lines here either, Ter Terence. And the, that's nothing new, like Shanaz was saying. We, we don't really see anything new. But for some reason, there's Joe Rogan. And Terence is an artist, right? I appreciate the fact that he's creative. His mind is opening. He's looking for something different. So, but when you're talking about mathematics, if you, first of all, mathematics is not 100% flawless. It isn't. In fact, I've, I've calculated that in nature, nature's geometries are not even sided like this geometry on my t-shirt. They're, they're naturally lopsided, like pick up a daisy and, 
and take measurements, which I've done. Nature will confuse you mathematically <laughs> because it doesn't, you can't put a perfect grid on top of it and get everything to line up. It doesn't do that. It has differentials and differentials are rhythms. There are harmonies and there are disharmonies and the disharmonies are the destructive phase and the harmonies are the sustainable, you know, uh, growth phase. I mean, I could go on and on about yeah, that. No, no, that. That's good. You pointed out that nature is foundationally imperfect and some men are born with three nipples. It's true. <laughs> right. I, I'm one of them. I can show you. There's a tiny little nipple next to one of my nipples. <laughs> Very good. Okay, on, on core flows and consciousness expansion, let's discuss the concept of core flows, the cosmic versions of the Schumann resonance and their impact on our local universe and individual uh, consciousness. Dave Emery, can you explain the uh, heliotelic color frequencies and their effects on consciousness expansion? Oh, you'll have to unmute. I muted you momentarily earlier. There we go. Okay. Um, oh, the core flows. Well, everything is shifting and changing uh, and as a result of the processional equinox whereby uh, energetic flows through the crystal spiral are pouring through the universal grids uh, of our frequency. So it's affecting everything. This is what David was talking about so eloquently earlier, and, and I believe he's absolutely correct. So the core flows often, um, they, they're sort of like uh, kismatic flows. They're electrothermal uh, plasma vapor flows, which exist in the eternal internal worlds and they are part of the infinite original universe. And what happens is that the crystal spiral allows these every so often to flow through the Earth's grid, the, the universe's grids. This is why um, we're seeing so many astounding core flow um, pictures uh, like the Aurora Borealis, etc. Core flows are like that, they are kismatic. That means that they are um, electrothermal, plasma vapor fields and through those plasma vapor fields uh, all of life actually does manifest in the lower domains where we are the holographic realms and so uh, the core flows are, a, are an aspect and an indication of how we are actually expanding our consciousness because consciousness is energy as we all know and energy is consciousness so it's all one and the same thing together as well. Well, very good. And what is the importance of human interaction with these energies in the ascension process? Um, we talk about you know, the color frequencies and their effects on consciousness. Well, these are mechanisms whereby we can um, expand our consciousness and, and it expands in, a, in accordance with specific uh, sequences. For example, dimension one has the color frequency of red. The next one is orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, dark silver, silver, gold, um, magenta. All of these are references to our chakra systems, our energy output systems, and also to our dimensional frequencies and to our DNA strands. So they're all connected. So everything is connected. And as the core flows flow through us, this helps us to expand our consciousness. So when Shanaz was saying so um, so wonderfully about how we're all waking up and becoming aware and becoming consciousness, she's so absolutely right on point because this is one of the mechanisms whereby infinite source allows us to expand if we choose in accordance with the free will universe. We don't have to, but many of us are. Very good, very good. Uh, Alex, a commentary. Yes, uh... Actually, we, we have done a few um, experiments when it comes to uh, uh, the, the expansions of energy within the water as well. So, and it was quite interesting because we had uh, numerous uh, samples, for example, also from the uh, solar eclipse. We had some water with us uh, and exposed it to the solar eclipse. And then later we would uh, use a specific technique to semi-freeze the water in a petri dish and then we would take some uh, photographs of it and then look at it under a microscope and it was uh, quite mind-blowing so we have a different lens system uh, which allows us to see these kind of uh, events unfolding so when it's freezing uh, so that we see all the different colors for example um, 
uh, which are in the in the uh, in the crystals of of the ice. And uh, specifically, when we used the water which was been taken uh, and exposed to the uh, solar eclipse, we could see that there was a number sequence, uh, sorry, a color sequence, which was coinciding with our chakra colors as well. And uh, so we could establish, we, we later on expanded this kind of uh, experiment and used the time-lapse uh, video technique to, to show that these kind of colors would all um, be created within the ice in a certain sequency. And that is something which we just discovered. Uh, so now we are putting a certain sound to the colors, which are again coinciding with our chakra system. And, uh, and then we have the correspondence from the water. So it's creating literally a melody, and we have the waters connected to other waters which are communicating in that way. So the water which has been ex uh, uh, exposed to the, um, to the uh, eclipse was completely different to any other waters we ever uh, investigated. No, in no, sorry, Alex, you're talking about the, the zone of silence where we were right. in, in the Mexican desert, correct? Yeah, that's right, that's correct. So um, when, when we have to talk, I will show some of these uh, images which we have taken and uh, go into more details, and I haven't got that today. But um, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And so what counts, of course, for the water which we have taken from the sacred springs, from Apimi, for example, and taken it to the desert, also counts for us as human beings because we are vessels of waters as well. So And these kind of changes are happening within us in these kind of uh, extraordinary changes which are going on at the moment uh, induced by the sun. And um, uh, so coming to, for example, to manifestation, and that's something which uh, one of my latest talks, I've been asking the audience and I said, so who actually has experienced um, the kind of manifestation process that you would think something and something would immediately happen? And it was quite interesting to see that there were a lot of people who kind of raised their arms and said, actually, I, I just manifested something yesterday in my thoughts and it just came to me today. And some people would say it's kind of instant manifestation. So something is changing here, uh, which has been induced by these kind of events, for sure. Very good. Very good. Uh, uh, Shanaz, speak a little about... about um, a human consciousness uh, as it relates to being the catalyst for uh, manifesting um, the field, whatever the field is, um, atmospheric conditions, climate, tornadoes, um, rain, <laughs> sun dancing, rain dancing. Um, <laughs> to speak from a scientific point of view kindly about the extrapolation from human ideation consciousness to manifesting effects in the field. Okay. So I think that that kind of uh, connects with the inner world, outer world, as above, so below. It's interesting, we're studying water, like, you know, uh, Alex is explaining about water. Water to me represents uh, kind of an aspect of our consciousness, right? We are mostly made of water. So the whole interaction that we have with ourselves and with, with the universe that we end up interplaying with is kind of a depiction of our subconscious mind, because, you know, our subconscious mind runs the show for the most part, and our conscious mind um, is, um, you know, doing lower than 90% uh, of the work. So based on that understanding of how we are in terms of how we interact with the world, based on the understanding that how quantum field, quantum physics explains the interconnection of us and everything at the subatomic level, based on the fact that all the mathematical equation and all the scientific um, discoveries have been made. However, it all has a limit because of the Planck scale, right? Because Planck scale is the small amount, which is the space between uh, the fundamental existence of us in the physical, right? In the atomic um, existence. So that information, when you really combine all of that understanding, you realize that you're always going to be catching up to yourself because there's always going to be a part of you that will never be able to comprehend the whole story because you are kind of divided into this uh, small limited vessel, right? To understand something that requires everybody to come together to understand. So there is that interesting dance that we're doing continuously, just like when David was explaining that how everything is continuously moving. And because of that, because everything is continuously moving, the whole the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, idea of saying 100% something 
makes no sense because everything is continuously moving. So therefore, we're always catching up to it. And that is the quantum dance that we're all going to be doing on a, on a, on a basis as long as we are in this vessel, right? When we turn into light or ascend and turn into form, then we're going to have a different type of school, different type of evolution. But the other thing that's interesting about the whole Schumann resonance and the, and the changes in the atmosphere, to me, is kind of like, you know, with the musical note and the octave, we have all these things at different level and different dimension, right? And as we are catching up to it, depending on what we want to do, we're going to experience that just like COVID. When COVID happened, my experience was very different than somebody else. And it's partly because I did not take anything the way everybody else took it, right? So, so that's where I think we all will have to do. And that's why I wrote the book, The Quantum Being, because I actually, uh, and thank you, Sasha, for giving me the most beautiful forward, because I love it. And, and the fact that you're saying that I, um, I'm showing up better in the world is partly because I'm embodying it. Like I, I wrote the book and then I said, I better learn how to embody it. And the more I'm embodying it, the more I'm having fun with it. And then the other thing I want to tell everyone is that we are a multidimensional species, which means that we are not in just one dimension, right? Physical is just one. Then we have emotional, mental, spiritual to simplify. And then on top of that, that is how every single thing in existence has that layered approach. So therefore, based on your vibration and frequency, you're interacting with the universe you are creating every nanosecond. Beautiful, beautiful. David, um, ascension, speaking about ascension, um, would you agree with me that uh, ascension is a, a, a biological process every bit as much as it is a so-called spiritual process? And is that not the point of our age, of our time, of, of our custodianship, of our navigation of this great shift of ages that's upon us is isn't the point that ascension is now a biological phenomenon well it, it is both because what we know in quantum physics about the observer and the observed see the observer is really interesting when you get deep into how the buddha really taught because the first thing he says is there is suffering but we interpret that as, yeah, they're suffering in life. That's not what he meant at all. Because once you practice meditation enough, you'll know what he really meant is suffering is over there. I'm now separate from suffering. I'm now ascending in this, this huge luminosity. And yes, now when the observer looks at the observed, the miraculous starts to appear. Masters start to have exactly what you said, Sasha, the physical starts to respond to this new ascended consciousness. And, and it's the same what Shanaz is saying in the quantum universe. If we take a picture of a fraction moment in time and we say, oh, that's what's happening in the quantum universe on, and, and really there is no Planck scale because nobody's ever really seen it. We haven't, we, we mathematically Supposed it, but we again. No, it's don't tell that. To, don't tell that to Dan Winter. For well, no, it, it doesn't. It's a lot of trouble. I know, but and I love getting into <laughs> trouble. By the way, I love trouble. Um, <laughs> so, There's no blank. He said, <laughs> when, "No, I'm saying we've never actually seen it." Very good. I'm saying there's no plank. And so science is always an argument. It's always trouble. It's supposed to be a dance. I've sat in the room with Nobel Prize winners, and all they do is fight, and then they laugh. <laughs> they freaking laugh their asses off, and then they're fighting again. And it, just like kids, but they're really brilliant kids. But Edgar Mitchell said something to me in an email once. He said, Edgar Mitchell has an MIT PhD in physics, and I have this email. I could find it. I, he's not impressed with mathematics at all. He tells he tells me this, and I'm like, what do you mean you're not impressed with mathematics? Because Mathematics is so anal retentive myopic, it doesn't really see what Shanaz is talking about. Like the quantum foam cannot be quantified. Richard Feynman found the behavior of photons bouncing off of surfaces is like a dance. You can't mathematically quantify the behavior of light. It, it seems to be conscious, just like you can't quantify, I couldn't quantify the behavior of a woman's mind. I couldn't put it in a mathematical formula because everything they do doesn't make any sense to me. But that's beautiful. That's the chaos that gives birth to the dance. So when Edgar Mitchell wrote me this note, I'm like, 
oh my god coming from him he's not impressed with mathematics well i'm impressed with mathematics to a point it's a very good approximation but actually sometimes you get really stuck with mathematics and it doesn't let you out of the box it put you in just like right now we can't understand and, and our understanding of physics how these uaps are doing what they're doing they're violating the law of physics law of physics just like trump violated what bill clinton could violate <laughs> you 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 just simply we put ourselves in a box and then you, you have to get out of the box and mathematics can put you in a box that is actually a mouse trap. So you have to be really careful with it. So we, if we if we change the parameters, if we say one times one is two, that, that's a new agreement. Well, what I say to Terrence is, let's see what you can do with it, Terrence. Let's see what you can build with that. Like Shanaz says, it's, you don't care how many patents you have. What can you do with it that's going to affect everything for everybody else? And finally, yes, when consciousness is ascending, we can suddenly see what the dark forces are doing because prior to that, we were inside of the box exactly. the dark forces put us in. Now we can actually see, oh, my God, you're crazy. You people are building prisons. <laughs> you're not liberating people's consciousness. You, you're not, you don't even know what ecstasy is. You don't know what ecstasy feels like because you're, you put yourself in a prison, then you put us in a prison. So when the human spirit has had enough of the prison, you actually won't be able to put it in the prison anymore. Beautiful. You won't Beautiful. even be able to do it. Beautiful. So I uh, thank you for raising the, uh, the 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 spirit of um, of Ed Mitchell. Um, I also had the great great um, honor of meeting of meeting him uh, sometime before he died, and he was he was quite an extraordinary uh, man, and I think he made a huge contribution to. Um, helping us break out of the um, proverbial box. And of course, Richard Feynman as well. Um, remarkable, remarkable being. I don't suppose you ever met him, um, David. I think you No, but I read his book, The Strange Theory of Light and Matter. And I loved, again, he has a sense of humor because he knows that math cannot do this. He can't explain <laughs> the way light behaves. It just can't do it. And he tried. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, Dave, Emery, keen to get your, your um, feedback on what uh, Shanaz and uh, David were speaking to. Oh, right. It's brilliant. You were both brilliant there. I'm just going to re-quote something. Yes, David, you're so right. We, we're stepping out of the box, mathematics box, whatever it may be. We're stepping out of the box. And Shanaz, I'm going to, I'm going to ask your permission if I can use your phrase because um, it's catching up to ourselves. You are so right. You see, we do have all these different aspects of ourselves, some you know, what we would call a physical body in dimension one, an emotional body dimension two, uh, a mental body in dimension three, uh, an etheric body in dimension four, an archetypal body in dimension five, and it goes all the way up, 18 dimensions in fact. So we have all these bodies. So what are we doing? We're catching up to ourselves because we are all there. We are the universe of our own selves. And so as we expand our consciousness, we come out of the mathematics box of the 3D world and we step into all of these different personas that we are, our other selves. And each time we expand our consciousness, and this is ex exactly what we are all doing in this time. And Alex's wonderful work with water is pointing us, it's a signpost towards how the physical and the spiritual do connect together through the resonant frequencies of the universe. So, folks, thank you very much for teaching me so many things today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote you. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay, so um, I, I want uh, whilst we're on, whilst you're um, in front of the camera, I should just mention, Dave, that um, you and I are doing a a cruise um, for the so. New Earth Horizon. <laughs> seminar at sea and we'll be traveling from greece um through cyprus turkey um egypt for about 10 days i i think we're going to be on the on the water stopping off at um some different spaces now in that in that time those 10 days on board a ship um we're, we're supposed to be 
um, doing a challenge, which is to essentially, <laughs> you see, he's getting very nervous already. And when, yeah, I'm nervous. We're months away from it. <laughs> but the spotlight is on you. The challenge is really how do we map 954 billion years of so-called time? And again, to be churlish about the subject, if we're going to play the uh, fiction of time, it's all a goddamn fiction. If we're going to play that game, let's do it right. Um, 13 to 14 billion years is the informed wisdom in popular academia. Um, how did they arrive at that, incidentally, um, David, your understanding? How did they arrive at 13.7 billion years, or whatever the hell is posited? Um, well, uh, Shanaz, I bet, is the person who's really the person you should ask this okay, for. Okay, Shanaz. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Don't throw me under the bus, guys. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a curious one, isn't it? You would think uh, something that time, the idea of time, is the very cornerstone, or you would think, of all that we deem as reality. And so how and who, which Midnight Mason came up with the notion of 13.7 billion years. That's what I want to know. No, that is a great question. And, you know, I actually understand time very differently, right? Because I, I quote Mike Dooley, who says time is an acronym, which means trace each other into material existence. So if you look <laughs> at time as a tool, because, you know, there's so there's two things, right? So, so I look at cyclic rhythm, the circadian rhythm we have in our body, right? The sun and the moon and the night and day that happens just by us breathing in and out, right? Just like we're breathing in and out. That dance is happening whether we have a clock or not. So to me, I right. look at that as a step towards evolution, right? So of course we need a way to major these things, just like we need to way, way to major other things. But whenever you're majoring something, you're collapsing with it based on quantum physics. And when you look at something, you affect it because of uh, electron behaves differently when you look at it. So Sasha, if I think about all of those concepts that I already understand, I don't take anybody's number at the face value because of that. You see my point? I absolutely do. I mean, Dr. Alex is a classic example of somebody who does measure things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, <laughs> speak about, speak about measurement. What are your thoughts momentarily on the idea of time being 13.7 odd billion years and who came up with that notion? I, I think time is hugely limiting, and uh, so I, I don't really, personally, I don't believe in any time concepts, to be honest. Uh, so it's it's just there to put us in a box, and um, the whole process of our, our lifetime being measured is ridiculous. So, right. Uh, and, and these kind of concepts, I don't believe in. No. Beautiful. Fantastic. And I couldn't agree more with you. And I think that that's the, the point. For me, uh, as, as Dave, uh, um, Dave Emery knows, my, my bugbear is time. I, I last looked, consciously looked, sought out and looked at a clock on the 1st of August in 1997. It's the, the thing I'm most proud of in, in life is that I have um, spent many, many years consciously decommissioning uh, my own um, tethering to the idea of time. I've not celebrated a birthday. In fact, I never celebrated birthdays in my life. But I, I just increasingly, as I've consciously, willfully uh, disconnected and untethered myself from the notion of time, I've seen what an extraordinary uh, freedom it, it brings. Um, I'm completely uncontained. I'm not connected uh, to um, the 1260 thing. I was also very fortunate to know Jose Aguelas and, and have a a, a very profound engagement with him, um, with his law of time and all of that. But um, Dave, the, 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 the 954 billion year um, idea that we're playing with on the cruise, how do we get from 13.7 billion to 954 billion? Let's just have fun with that idea momentarily. We get there <laughs> over a very long period of time. And... Um... <laughs> Uh, but listen, uh, I'm so delighted. Uh, Shanaz and, um, and Alex have now opened a doorway um, with regard to the non-existence of time. So does that mean the cruise is off? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it means that we'll probably be made to walk the plank, actually, in October <laughs> at some point. <laughs> okay. 
Well, um, based based on uh, on that um, very considerable threat, I don't want to walk the plank. What I will say is that um, uh, our, our conception of um, time in the three D sense, um, time is not linear; it's simultaneous, and uh, and it it is a construct which exists in the lower dimensional realms um, for a specific reason, uh, because there is a cosmic time clock upon which. Um, over 15 days, there was a cycle whereby um, elements could be constructed. Um, however, uh, to go back to 954 billion years, yes, it is certainly a stretch. And uh, and with regard to the scientific accuracy of all of that, I can't I can't vouch for it. But what I can tell you is that the stories that have been created throughout all of that time are the stories which have en enabled us to be here now so that we can expand our consciousness and talk as we are talking. Everything is connected, whether it's 954 billion years ago or 37 seconds, everything is connected. So I think the cruise will be a spectacular success and certainly people will go away with a fabulous story of time it etched into the tapestry of their lives. Very good, very good. And David, you've you've had um, some of your professional um, uh, past has been connected uh, somewhat to the, um, um, I, I don't want to say the deep state, but certainly what lies beneath in, in, in the basement of the scientific and even military uh, community. Um, what what are your what is your understanding of Project Looking Glass uh, as it relates? And, and and what what do you understand? Uh, how far back in time, or how how far into the future is your understanding? Was did Project Looking Glass take us? Well, when you look at time in itself, from what I can see, and I have a whole model of this. We could do a whole deep presentation on this that I think your audience would understand because I had this experience on January the 7th, 2000, where Tesla and two other masters wearing white robes with gold cords appeared in the middle of the day. I saw them with my eyes open and he flashed this galactic clock, which I wrote down and created into a model and put in my first film that really explains time very well. And I, I've spent a lot of focus and, um, on the subject of time. And so the universe, at the moment of the supposed Big Bang, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the problem physicists can't answer, it didn't do this and expand. It preeminently, before time even had a value, evenly distributed itself in this infinitude. And then basically time dilates because the universe starts forming more and more vortices and therefore more resistance and more inertia so that it appears that the universe is way older than it really is because you measure time by the speed of light. And of course, they do know, classical physicists, that the speed of light was faster and slowed down, but they don't really measure in a quantity of measurement that would suggest how long it took for the speed of light to slow down. And then for when you measure backwards, you're measuring through time. And we do the same thing in our lives. So my youngest daughter is eight years old and she thinks, well, I've only got eight years of memories. But watch when you're 16, suddenly you fill that space in your mind with infinite ideas. And suddenly it looks like it, time is slowing down. And then when you're 30, you think, oh, my God, I'm so old. I, I've been living so long and I've got all these ideas that I fill this time with. And in a way, by the time you're 60 something like me, which, is, again, is not old in time, but the mind becomes infinite. It starts having all these refractive memories and it plays with thought forms and suddenly Everything is more full of ideas and stuff. And you think, how can I only be 60? Because when I was six, if I just multiply that by 10, I should only have this much space. So space is the same thing. It actually slows time down. It physically does this. So if I go to the place of quantum mechanics action at a distance where everything is instantaneous, first of all, you have no curvature. 
And you need curvature to create gravity, which creates time. So if everything inst is instant, there is no curvature, right? For example, you don't see anything right now. You're seeing even a fly buzzing around in front of your nose like a trillionth of a second ago. You see the moon a quarter of a second ago. You see the sun eight minutes and 21 seconds ago. And in that time, you're, what you're really seeing is you're not seeing anything as it is. You're seeing a hologram, which is an image coming off of it. And the same with the image of you walking around, getting out of the bathtub and singing whatever you do in the day. That image, even the, the, the thermal part of it goes right through the roof, it goes out into space, and it's a hologram. So when you really understand that light is really a presentation that is actually a hologram, you're not seeing anything right now. There's nothing you're seeing right now. So what is, what is this thing we're in? Because all of it is trapped in this time matrix, and therefore... To measure time when the speed of light is so is really slow, it's really slow. We don't, we're looking at the images of the universe and saying they're 13.7 billion years old. But they're, they're not, they're not um, factoring in the instantaneity of the quantum. So the quantum action at a distance that Einstein, he tried to solve it, it was not solved. In fact, the Nobel Prize last year was given to three physicists who are really getting close to actually solving the, the action at a distance phenomenon and putting it into a real telecommunication system. And once you do that, eventually you'll be able to give us a picture of the real universe. And so when you see the real universe, you might know that the universe doesn't have a time value because you can't your, your time is at zero at the moment of the Big Bang, which is, and I'm not saying I agree with the Big Bang, but which, because that's what physics is. It's a game. So time value zero, mass value is zero. Therefore, energy in equals mc squared has a value of zero. So everything is zeros. But the moment this happens, that the CMB evenly distributed itself everywhere, which is impossible. Today, if you tried to create a flash in the existing umbrella of what we call the fabric of space and distribute and amass energy infinitely everywhere you can't do it because there's resistance for that to happen but in the beginning there was no resistance so your time was a value of zero and as the universe got more and more dense the value for time kept going up and then the value for mass went up and then the value for energy went up so if you're really looking for zero and what zero point really is you, you have to come back to the place where all your values for time, mass, and energy are all zeros. And therefore, the universe is, is a hologram. It's actually a hologram. If I look at a star like uh, Vega that I'm seeing 26 years ago, so you're looking back at a hologram that was projected 26 years ago. Mm -hmm. This will really trip you out. It, it's actually quite difficult to accept that even if I look at a bug on the floor, I'm seeing it in time. You're seeing it in time. So in a way, time is the binder of the matrix that isn't real, that is a maya, that is an illusion. So when you, when you understand that we all have this quantum function built into us because physicists have measured it, that the human heart of a mother and baby rabbit connected to electroencephalogram, EEG, with all the wires to the brain. If you pinprick the baby, the mom fills it 6,000 miles away instantaneously, not at the speed of light, instantaneously. So when you look at that 13.7 billion year age, they haven't factored in the, the quantum action at a distance. They're, they're only factoring in the hologram that is spreading itself giving us Maya. Very good. Very good. So um, anyone here, this is an open question to this panel. Anyone know what the biggest um, unanswered question is commonly understood to be the biggest unanswered question or um, unanswerable question? I mean, there's a whole bunch of them, but apparently the biggest one is why do we exist? Why does the universe exist? Why do we exist? And that, that, that 
is a curious question. Anyone want to um, have a yeah. have a go at that? I, I will go with that, Sasha, because it's interesting, right? I actually was teaching uh, in one of the school. It's a home school, uh, quantum physics, and one of the eight-year-old girl, a girl, asked me that, like, can you explain using quantum physics that why do I exist? And it's funny that you're asking the same question. And uh, I actually, because you know, I know that uh, uh, there is a there is a quote, right? I think, therefore I am. But I say that I think, feel, and sense, therefore I am, right? Because if you really think about it, that you can close your eyes, you know, you can just do whatever you want. But as long as you are still breathing, right, in this body, you can definitely think, right? You can definitely feel, and you can definitely sense based on your senses. So, so there is a reason we are here interacting with everything. And that is a great question, Sasha, that you're saying that, okay, why do we exist? I believe that we exist so that we can integrate all aspect of ourselves. And once we integrate to the level where we no longer care or no longer feel any resistance to anything, then that's what ascension is. And, and it has different level depending on how far you go in your integration. Because at the end of the day, when you are no longer existing in this physical form, you are still existing somewhere in the cosmos as a star, You're, yeah. you, right? And you are that light. And, and, and to me, like, you know, it's funny because I have a ex-husband who says that once we die, we are done. And I never agreed with him, but I said both ways you are covered, right? If you die and you're done, then you have nothing to worry about because you can't feel anything anyway, right? <laughs> so I'm like, it solves the problem. And if I believe that I do, I will exist like a cue. Remember in the Star Trek, there's a cue who can be yeah. anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. That to me is, is what it is, right? So in, in all cases, you have to still take responsibility. If you can feel anything, you have to take responsibility. Very good. Dr. Alex, um, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good question, but uh, yeah, I, I, I do believe um, that existence um, is a sequence of synchronicities. Uh, so I think that we all have a very special place in this life, of course we do, and uh, that our existence and why we're here is also in the big plan, uh, a plan of synchronicities. So in, in short, um, I think we we live we live, live in an interdimensional kind of reality, in my opinion, and uh, I think that there are so many more questions to to who we are really and uh, what what our purpose here is. But in our reality, I think we can find our purpose and make a change and go into the future and um, create something beautiful. And so long we do this, I think, then we are. Uh, synchronizing with uh, with a with a big plan of of why we are here in the first place. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I I want to invite anyone on this panel to raise any question amongst anyone else on this panel. I don't want to be leading uh, the conversation here on out. Well, I, I want to comment to what you just asked, Sasha. Why are yeah. we here? I mean, applying myself to meditation every single day for forty five years plus you ask the question you really get into when you say who am i why am i you just look infinitely within in the beginning it seems like the i is this solid thing that's looking out feeling out sensing outwards and inwards but eventually the the, the questioner and the observer starts to dissolve and it no longer is a solid thing looking into who am i why am i and eventually you real you just feel pure infinite i am ness i i am ness and you realize the same question about creation you weren't actually created you always were the consciousness where the really heavy bliss starts to show up, it always was. In fact, it doesn't have a time value. It, it's it's infinitely always M. So when you get into pure I am ness, you you enter the field and the skin, the perimeter of the body, starts to have less and less meaning, 
it has meaning because because we're in these these things but we were you start to experience that we were created with as much intention as a star or a planet really that much every one of us is so incredible we're so incredibly beautiful at our core if we could just authentically be in a civilization, our, our, our natural self, our, our pure emness, is because no longer I am, it's just emness, just mm -hmm. is. And then you start to feel what's going on in the universe and you go, wow, this thing is incredible. It, it, I was never created this body was created, but I, I, the, the pureness of I am and just am ness. And then just the, so in the beginning, the observer and observe relationship is like two stones hitting each other. And then it's like water flows into, uh, tries to, it tries to dissolve the solidity of the observer. And there's a lot of ways to dissolve the solidity of the observer and we do those things there all the time. Everything, literally, a human orgasm is a huge explosion of energy, just like a solar flare. Mm -hmm. just, the sun flares, and 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 then a kundalini rising, and 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 then when we we learn how to tune the the rhythms of the electrical nervous system into the harmonies of the order. And, and that's why I've spent my life looking at the actual frequencies and the ratios of relationships of frequencies in cosmos and exposing them to the human system, just like we did with the sound of the sun on the human heart. We found the heart got huge and all the other chakras got small. You start to see how this thing works. And it's really more, it almost seems like more went into creating you than went into creating the sun. It almost seems like it because we're that sophisticated because we're not just the body, but the, the spiritual part of us is so incredible when we just spend the time. Like, I mean, this is, this is the Buddha's notion. The, the Buddha's notion is you're not going to, you're not going to live on a belief system. You're going to sit there and find out what you're really made out of. And then eventually you start to see that you are God. I mean, the grand organizing designer. You're there is no separation between you, which is why Jesus said you you are as gods. And the, and he's quoting the Old Testament and saying that he's quoting the prophets. But you have to come to the place where again, there's something about humans. We put each other in prisons, and you you got to get out of the the prison. And you know what physicists did. They tried trapping photons in a box. It's called a wave trap. And the and the photon, or even trapping an electron, which has material mass, will quantum tunnel through the wall and generate a faster-than-light event. The faster-than-light event wouldn't happen unless you put it in the prison first. Exactly. <laughs> so the body's the prison. It's actually the mind that's the prison. And then when you realize you're trapped... And, and then you learn how to become highly tuned, like a highly tuned instrument. You get out, but you accelerate. Now you're That's going true. faster than light. And when you're going faster than light, time dilates. <laughs> then the universe isn't 13.7 billion years old. But how old are you is, when you really think about it, you were actually created. You were actually created. That's incredible in itself. The more you become mystified by yourself, like I was created. So why am I here? Is the universe knew exactly what it was doing when it's creating it? Now you mean right? Yourself. Well, I mean you'd still get stoned to death in some parts of Alabama for saying right. that, that you are God. I mean, yeah. but that that just that, that's a curious thing, isn't it? About how incredibly uh, diverse we are as a human species. I mean, it's just so extraordinary. You go from absolute twattery and the most mundane and moronic right. uh, subhuman still lurching around, led only by appetites and addictions to luminescent beings and avatars and uh, masters. Certainly there's one master um, that I'm well aware of in, in, uh, in, in um, um, 
in Bhutan. I'm so sorry, it's not Bhutan. Um, I'm trying to remember where, where he lives. I published photographs of him well over 1,020 um, um, years now of age. The avatar most famed in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and known to the all members of the royal family in Morocco is uh, well over 800 years of age. And um, my friend Margot Anand, um, who's just turned 80, and she's terribly proud of that fact, um, has spent some considerable time uh, in recent years with um, some of the immortals in, in Asia, um, very much off-grid, and she's uh, learned the song of the immortals and brought it back. Um, and I've experienced it with her, just extraordinary stuff. But, yeah, just this incredible spectrum of of uh, of humanity one wonders um just to talk about that number the 144 100 david we we um two years ago actually three years ago with lazarus symposium we were working with um your friend uh, jimmy um jimmy Bla jimmy blanchett correct yeah yeah and um we were bouncing uh signals off the moon and reaching out to aliens and then dashing off to the desert um, with a bunch of walkie-talkies to receive the signal back some hours later, and and uh, lo and behold, there it came. You know, extraordinary stuff. What what's become of that work, incidentally? Um, are you still uh, ch uh, chasing that work down with with Jimmy? Well, remember, yeah, he was doing the 144 megahertz and 432 megahertz, and of course, 144 times three is 432. And of course, the, the three days and three nights that Jesus speaks of, of going under and then being born again is 4,320 minutes. So, yes, those radios, um, Jimmy himself, you should probably have him on and do a one on one with him because he's he's posting these incredible mathematical um, discoveries. See, what happens is I watch Jimmy and I say, Jimmy. You're exposing yourself to the 432 megahertz and the 144 megahertz. In fact, my scepter over there, which is one perfect row cubit, is 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 144 megahertz. As an antenna, that scepter you see on the couch, and I, I meditate and I put it on my knee, and I go into way higher bliss than my baseline. I set it down. The bliss comes down, but it's still at a very good level, and then I put it on my knee again, and I go way, way up. Now, Jimmy... Has, see, I talk about this in the old days when we are we we're driving down the freeway, you're manually tuning your radio to 97.36 megahertz, and there's Led Zeppelin, right? Your whole car is enveloped in the wavelength of that frequency, and that's a pretty big wavelength. It's way bigger than the car. So we were all in those days getting the frequencies of the radio station and the music felt different when it was coming in. Even the static had a magic charm to it, but now we're in the gigahertz band. So, but we're not using radios. We're communicating through the internet and the Wi-Fi, and we're, we're way up above, you know, two, three, all the way to 30 and higher gigahertz. Right. So with Jimmy, this is what, this is my insight. By working with those radios at 144 and 432 megahertz, he creatively incited and sees how the universe is really working. And he's getting, he's posting all the time on Facebook. And most people just go right by it. I check every one. And I'm like, Jimmy, it's actually the frequency that's causing this mass awakening in you because there was a reason the staff was, just, was at two and a half perfect royal cubits which is what my staff is over here and that the scepter was tuned to 144 megahertz because when you hold it you get 144 megahertz and that it's not the frequency itself it's how you respond to it so if i play some music to you some people might dance some people might not dance it, 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 there's frequency and frequency response the frequency of the earth is not the Schumann resonance. It's really close to it when you actually do the math. The Schumann resonance is the first wave in response to the frequency of the earth. The frequency of the earth based on its wavelength is about 7.48 hertz and the Schumann resonance is 7.83. And that's perfect because if I take a cymatic dish of water, I induce a frequency on it 
the first frequency in the dish is not the frequency that I gave it. It's the first standing wave that responds to that frequency. So we're the same. If I give you 144 megahertz, you might not have the math um, realizations that Jimmy Blanchett's having. You might have something completely different that awakens within you. Right. But there is a reason that we had these staffs and these instruments, um, which which I've been making for, for, for many, many years for people, is because, and the reason you saw the Egyptians with their staffs and the goddesses with their staff and Athena with their staff is it's a, it's a high frequency musical instrument and it causes an awakening in the consciousness. So, so Jimmy is, has been exposed to 144. In fact, that's the frequency we sent out all my wife's songs on to all the planets in the, in the solar system after she died. And then she responded, we use Jimmy's antenna at, 432 megahertz and 150,000 watts, 150,000 watts. No wonder my wife responded. Yeah. So Jimmy is getting the benefits. He, I don't even know if he realizes it, but, but he's doing those frequencies all the time because his antenna is putting those frequencies out. And then he has another insight if you go on his Facebook. So I, I, I think um, it'd be really worth, you know, having a yeah. There. Well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely invite him back. I'm very keen to to chase that down. Um, what I'm driving at um, with the 144 or the 144100 uh, is um, is is it your understanding that we've reached that threshold um, of sufficient actualized angelic humans to be now uh, certifiably catalyzing the great ascension event that's really what i'm driving at well like i said the more a person is awakened first of all the more they see that they're in prison a prisoner who has been a prisoner for millennia doesn't even know they're in prison like they don't even know their mort gauge is a means in latin death gauge it means you're going to die in that agreement for a house that's already built we're going to be prisoners forever so once you realize you're in prison, that's already an awakening. And I think more and more people, and you, Sasha, have been exponential in revealing this to people about the prison and the matrix and how to get free, right? And then once a person has the fear of their survival removed, we were talking about this before the show, all of us, they can be their authentic self they don't have to invent lies and schemes to make money. They don't have to be criminals and rob people. If you were fully sustained as a human being and you had no reason to believe you were going to end up on the street and we forgave all debt. I believe we have to forgive all debt to save this planet. Yes. Because yes. most of the fuel we're burning is going to a job that doesn't need to be done, but it's fictitious to pay for the house that's already built. I mean, an alien race would look at us and go, are you stupid? You're going to pay for that thing for 30 years and it's already built. Okay. So, so which means our capacity to build structures is so great that <clears throat> we could give everybody structure. And we could give everybody food too. So let's say there's a certain percentage of the population that doesn't want to do anything. Watch what happens if you feed them, house them, they'll get bored. And they'll naturally volunteer and say, how can I help? What can I do that I would like to do? Then you'd have authentic humans. You would have humans that would be doing what they love to do. And they're not being forced to come up with this number every month to pay for all this stuff. That already exists. The car already exists too. It's, it was created, and and so why are we doing this to each other? Because we agreed to it. We actually did because we're afraid to go back to being a hunter gatherer and pitching a tent like a lot of people are doing in our cities, and saying I've had it with the prison. Now, if if everybody agrees to say I've had it with the prison. Believe me, it'll change overnight. Very good. Very good. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And yes, you're right. I mean, it, and that does come down to uh, to the zero point. And once we once we are no longer um, feel compelled to right. um, to parasite off or feast off one another in any way, shape, or form, that right. to me, by definition, is the zero point. Um, mm -hmm. Then, of course, we move into affirmation. We move into 
uh, expansiveness. And at that at that time, we're able to contemplate the navel and simply lean into um, creative expansion. And that for sure describes to me uh, the counterpoint to this fallen light of Atlantis uh, that we've still been um, wading through e even in our in our generation. Um, so let let's let's look to um, wrap this conversation up. We've been talking about frequency. We've been talking about um, um, cosmic events. Um, talking about um, the, the the myriad of different possibilities that exist with human consciousness and how we manufacture reality and notions of such as time um, come in and out of the play. Um, we're now approaching June, uh, Midsummer's Day of, of 2024. Word on the street in the military, um, the, mil the sort of deep state um, street, is that we are entering into a shit storm, a shit show, either way, this year. Um, the fact that Donald Trump was found uh, guilty yesterday or today um, on 3,000 charges, um, just absolute spurious nonsense, dreamt up by um, a satanic status quo masquerading as um, jurisprudence. Um, the fact that Bill Clinton, um, I'm not turning this into politics, but I do want to use this as an example. The fact that 25, 30 years ago, whenever it was that that turgid little actor, Bill Clinton, uh, was getting blowjobs under the presidential uh, table um, and and paid hush money at that time to that ghastly woman, Paula, whatever her name was. I think she got a check for about $850,000 and proudly held it up uh, with the Associated News Network syndicating that. Well, he didn't exactly face uh, criminal charges. So the, the satanic status quo would have to manufacture um, bullshit and um, I'm not endorsing or supporting Donald Trump's position just to say that when you've got um, the status quo weaponizing itself against um, a former president, it's desperately serious matter. Or is it? Or is what's really happening actually a counterpoint play? Is it that Trump being found guilty is Trump slash white hat enterprise creating the precedent, creating a precedent that a former president can, in fact, be indicted. Is that what's going on? So that when they claw back this year power from the fetid uh, sock puppet Joseph Biden and his cronies, that they indeed, uh, Biden, Obama, the Bushes, the Clintons, can also be rounded up as former presidents now because the precedent has been set with Donald Trump. Is that what's going on? You know, So we're in this wonderful uh, flux of, um, sort of psycho-cultural, psycho-political mindfuckery where nobody knows where we stand in the equation of things, where all of us cast adrift, which is perfect to me, to my mind. It's absolutely perfect that we're all caught, uh, cast adrift at this end of time time. Um, I just want to invite each of you in closing to just give a sense of um, what you feel um, we are entering into as we move toward midsummer 2024. Shanaz, I'll start with you. Oh, darling, you're, you're, you're um, muted. Yeah, it's funny, Sasha. Everything you just said is very interesting because you said the conundrum we are in. Uh, when you look at the politics that we're interacting with. And then everything that David Sarita said about we live um, pretty much in a holographic reality, right? So that is the conundrum, right? Because you are always catching up to it. But the thing that I would like to say is that whatever is the truth, when you truly don't know what the truth is, the one thing you can do is not necessarily feed into the problem, right? Because, you know, there's always a problem and there's always a solution. So that is the one thing that I would urge everybody to do is to not become part of the problem, but become part of the solution. 
And uh, and I'll give you a, like a very interesting example, right? That if you are ordered a food and you're waiting and the food is not coming to the table, then are you going to just keep waiting for the food or are you going to get up and go and go to the kitchen and actually say, you know what, what's going on? And they'll say, well, we don't have enough people to make the food. You might as well roll up your sleeves and start making the food for yourself. That's where I feel like everybody needs to go is to look around and see what's going on and just roll up their sleeves and clean up the mess. Because if we start doing that, we're going to open a whole new portal where we're no longer going to be waiting for anything to happen to us, to have us that amazing life. We are going to be participating in it because we live in a participatory universe and every action that we feed into based on quantum physics, it opens up a new portal because it changes everything. So yeah, so I feel like we need to go in that mindset because right now we do have a lot of illusions to sip through, right? Because of just the way we are, uh, we are con con continuously dealing with illusion in all different forms. And that is the nature of the beast, right? So I feel like we are all watching our own movie, and but we are the star in our own movie. And because we are the star, we have to at least do the part that we are able to do with integrity, and um, so that we can ultimately transcend ourselves into ascension. Beautiful. And uh, I have to say, I commend you for using the word participatory. I've never heard anyone use the word participatory. And you yeah. used it perfectly. And it came out seamlessly. <laughs> you, get a gold, you get a gold star today, Shanaz. I'm allowed oh, to thank you. <laughs> um, Alex, Dr. Alex Ling. Um, we're going to next um, on the next initiative talk about um, Aquan, your incredibly uh, noble endeavor, which I think is just extraordinary. So we're going to put a lot of um, time and effort into that. But um, kindly, um, your reflections on the conversation that mm. we've had here today. I think that the uh, the system is decaying and crumbling away, so it will make it will have to. Make uh, space for for the new, and uh, it, it's it's not sustainable anymore from any any point of view. So um, and also uh, we talked about it previously, um, uh, talking about these these uh, 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 figures who have been holding the strings for such a long time. Many of them have been removed already, and I think what is left is just like the shell and some very desperate people who try to hold the powers. But the awakening uh, amongst humanity is huge. And uh, we have found that there's a hugely positive uh, a positivity amongst all humans who are awake and who know uh, which way to turn. So, and I think it's an unstoppable machinery. Uh, it's far too late for them to stop us. And this is just a desperate try to suck us back into this control mechanism which is definitely not going to happen. Indeed. So I do believe in humanity and I do think and know that we, uh, we are moving into a beautiful future where we manifest everything beautiful which we deserve. Very good. Thank you. David Sarita, please, your closing thoughts and really the, uh, just underscoring that same question, um, where, do, where do you see us moving as a, as a collective um, through this, this extraordinary um, period of time coming up. I, I really do believe that midsummer this year toward midsummer 2025 is the threading of the camel through the eye of the needle. That's my real sense of where we're at planetarily. Uh, but what, what is your sense? Well, we're at 144 minutes right now. So there's the 144, the synchronicity. Um, I, I think we're at the point where, like I was saying, we're going to have to, for, if, if we want to survive, we're going to have to forgive all debt. We're going to have to um, evolve towards more sustainable energies. Hydrogen will prove itself to be better than than electric transportation. Absolutely, will prove it. Be and then uh, what's actually happening in politics is it's about who throws the most money and the most influence to beat the opponent. It's so clear. That In fact, there are multiple presidents, including the Kennedy brothers who had extramarital affairs and had, you know, prostitutes and things like that. Um, th that idea goes way back to the kings, you know, to, to Caesar, to the Romans. 
that men in positions like that seem to have large sexual appetites. So the, the fact that Trump is giving her hush money is really just showing also how incredibly um, repressed our culture is in the first chakra compared to, say, Europe and, and even other places I've been. Um, I would say, like, you know, my dad sent us, brought us to nude beaches ever since I was a kid. And once you go to nude beaches all the time, you're not... You're not repressed. You look at a person because they're a person. You, you look at the body. We all have different shapes and different kinds of bodies. But, you know, topless beaches in Europe, things like that, they're, they're not as uptight as we are. So he has to hide this, this relationship. And because he hid it, and so did Clinton, and so did the Kennedys, and so did, um, so did President Johnson, they all did. So, so why does why does Trump deserve the beating he's getting if our elected officials all have done the same thing? I mean, in fact, even the heads of our churches. I mean, Tammy Faye Baker and and you know the Jim. Jeff Mahan, Like, we have so many of those stories in our culture. And what does it tell us? Okay, it tells us that we're actually repressed. We have a problem. And. Then you go to this phenomenon that's happening today, and, and I just see it all over the internet, is there's just mass digital prostitution going on. And, and to me, that says that those young ladies and, and men don't have enough money to make their, their ends meet. A day job is not going to give you a life. A day job hasn't given you a life for, for almost the last you know, 50, 60 years, actually. Yeah. So we... We've, I remember when my father um, in the 60s in Berkeley, you just have to have a simple job and you put your family in a house and you feed them. If you have a simple job today, you're not feeding, you're not even going to put yourself in, a, in, a, in an apartment. So that that's why we have to forgive all debt. We have to give everyone access to housing, everyone access to food, and we got to eliminate most of the, of the waste of fuel, people driving around, burning all this fuel to get to a job that is really just a made up thing in order that for them to come up with this fictitious amount of money again, that we agreed to. So that would solve the greater portion of the environmental crisis. When you liberate people's minds, you don't just say, everybody go on vacation. We're going to take care of you. They will naturally like Shanaz says, roll up their sleeves. You know, let's make the food <laughs> like let's, Let's work the fields. Let's do this together. Let's make jo even simple jobs like farming, which actually isn't simple. Let's make it beautiful. Like imagine if we had agricultural centers where they had community, you know, meeting places. They had showers and bathing and everybody could be nicely dressed after, you know, working in the farm all day and have a place to sit down and read a book or like instead of making them like, you know, slop like like their environment is slovenly and you know they're slovenly dressed they're 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 not even clean if we made all the jobs workspaces beautiful there would be no resistance to doing our own agriculture right reconnect to the plant kingdom i mean i know i love going into my own garden which is huge and pulling out lettuce and putting some olive oil and lemon on it and avocado and sprouts that I grew and make myself a salad. Well, we said we don't do that job anymore. So why are we seeing so many people coming up with like, like um, I, I can uh, only fans, like there's women on there bragging, they're making $5 million and they can't believe it. What does that tell you? It tells you how incredibly repressed our culture is incredibly repressed so that the trump story that we're all looking at right now what did this guy do what did he do he was obviously feeling that he wanted to have this experience but he wanted it to be quiet but somehow he wanted to have the experience but the desire to make it quiet means that he's actually he's a repressive person he actually is repressed because he, his culture can't accept him doing that. Yet King Solomon can have 700 wives, who's a religious yeah. figure. Yeah. Right? So uh, what I see happening and what's coming up is if we don't make the transformations, the liberation of money and debt, the, the debt is enormous, 
it's not owed to any person, actually. The, the money goes into extinction when the debt is expired. It doesn't even exist. The, 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 the interest portion is the profit that goes to the bankers and the profiteers at the top. So you have that phenomenon in our culture, too, that, that people just seem to need so much money to get the attention that whatever it is they want in their life to repress the masses. But actually, our, our, our true potential as humans is so great that we can build all the cars we need, as long as we do it sustainably, we'll survive, all of the homes we need. There's infinite rock and resources and new materials to make homes out of for everybody. We're just stuck in this number game. And that's that's the game we got to get out of. Very good. Okay. Well, I wanted to get your prognosis on where you thought humanity was headed. Uh, I can I can well, see. Well, I think they're headed over the cliff. <laughs> I think we're headed over the cliff. See, that's why I went the other way because it's so obvious we're heading over a cliff. You can see where the military is going. We can see that that Biden just liberated Ukraine and said you can use our missiles long range into Russia now, which is which is the precipice for a nuclear conflict. You can see humanity is going over the cliff. So. It's so obvious that there, we're not headed in mass in the right direction. It's just so okay. obvious. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, um, Emery, what are your thoughts on where we're at, your closing sentence yes. as our last panelist to speak to this? Um, yeah, your closing thoughts. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, the, uh, the Trump thing, it's a script. Uh, it's a setup um, to do exactly what you said, Sasha. That's my view. It's to take down all the others um, uh, and with a pre with a legal precedent. So it's a script. In fact, what we're watching actually is the decline of a frequency paradigm. Um, an energetic paradigm is coming to the end. It can't be stopped. It's absolutely on its way out. And these are the last shouts of hurrah for those people who cannot see the vision of expansion of consciousness. So it's the end of a paradigm. <clears throat> and in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what we did is many lifetimes ago, we actually bought a ticket to the theater, the theater of life on earth. And we had to suspend our disbelief. You know, when you go in to watch uh, Matt Damon in a film, you've seen him before, you're in a, in a new film with Matt Damon, but you have to suspend your disbelief, otherwise you wouldn't believe anything you're seeing. So we bought a ticket for a, for, um, a theatre show many lifetimes ago, and we deliberately suspended our disbelief. Unfortunately, it went on too long, and certain individual beings got in charge of the energetic frequencies. And so what happened is our suspension of disbelief went on too long. And so now what's happened is the energies are flowing through us. We're all expanding consciousness. And what has that done? We no longer have suspended our disbelief. We can see what's going on. Hey, guys, the curtain's been pulled back. I can see the Wizard of Oz. I realize who I am and I know absolutely who you are. And we're not going that direction anymore. So what we've got today is the the dis, the dispiration the dispension of uh, an old paradigm the energetic frequency is falling apart and the new frequencies which you've all been talking about here so brilliantly are now taking over so i'm i'm with i'm with alex and and, and many others that we are on our way up into a new paradigm of energetic frequency and it can't be stopped Beautiful. Thank you very much indeed. Friends, that brings us almost to the top of the hour, almost perfectly. And I just want to thank uh, Shanaz Asoni, um, Dr. Alex Ling, David Sarita and Dave Emery uh, for joining us today on the opening segment of Lazarus. Friends, thank you so very much. It's been delightful spending time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Very good, friends. Okie dokie. Sorry, Alex. Bye-bye. I'll speak to you very shortly. Bye now. Bye now. Christy, thank you for that. Beautiful. Um, so, friends, I want to, um, just closing this segment, before we um, take it to members, I want to just play, um, as Dave Sarita was speaking about um, 
sustainability and about zero points and about um, how we need to just, the ascension process begins when we hit that event horizon in our lives, when we fully actualize and recognize that we need to reclaim jurisdiction, the sons and daughters of God, that we need to um, reinstall the software, so to speak. And not just genealogically, um, which is why mRNA and DNA intervention through vaccine programs and through um, the agrochemical and pharmaceutical in industry base over the last century, poisoning every aspect of our lives and weaponizing the entire biosphere has been integral to the satanic agenda to keep us biologically constrained uh, using synthetic molecules, which is to say the language of the devil. Um, if you understand the mathematics and the frequency wars taking place inside the human body and in the built environment and in the biosphere itself. So we are about to reach that um, nexus point, that flash point um, of actualization. What does it look like on the other side? I'm in Romania um, here with my, my team. I've been today, um, actually for hours, we went out um, to the free zone, not to a couple of hours from Bucharest, um, where we're getting gearing up to go into production later this year and manufacture and production of technologies that we've been incubating for the last couple of years here. Many of you who follow my rambling and my wheezing know some of what we've been doing, and it's very exciting. So we've got our own technologies, which we've been steadily um, incubating, the engineers, the engineering, and uh, what have you the prototyping. And we know that we are at the point where we can essentially design, build a grid on zero point, which costs, leaves no cost for transportation, no costs for refrigeration, no costs for heating, for lighting, and so on and so forth, which means agriculture becomes free. Um, Greenhousing becomes free, which means we can grow the most exotic um, foodstuffs. We don't need to import anything from anywhere around the world. Which means that this idea that um, abundance and prosperity in the modern context is the fact that we've got these exotic things from all around the world that we import in to our supermarkets and into our high street, of all of which is a bullshit exercise in um, racketeering and profiteering through trade links. Um, and yes, it's nice to have, um, you know, Madagascar and apricots and whatever, noni fruit from Indonesia and what have you. But when you have greenhousing capability and on free energy and no energy uh, or utility costs, you're talking about being us being able to essentially um, have the most exotic lifestyles and be able to grow everything plentifully and in abundance at little to no cost. We're talking about zeroing out utility, which means severing the umbilical cord to the kingdom of the devil, because that's what it's all about. The fact that you're watching this broadcast, either from a gated villa, if you're lucky, or um, some risible tenement block in some shitty, um, grid, kill grid, city. Um, God bless you, whoever you are. But the fact is that each of us are being systemically poisoned, harvested, um, wherever we are. And we each of us having to um, move against conscience most of the time in order to do jobs, in order to pay the bills. And the bills are always energy. It's always energy. It's down to transportation, heating, lighting, cooking, and so on and so forth. Logistics, the logistics of, of modern living. It's all about energy and how we have to pay the bills in order to survive. So survivalism, fight and flight, becomes 
again, the cornerstone of our pretty shitty existence, which means that we become the parasite and we feast off one another, whether we're clambering our way up the corporate ladder um, or um, just needing to um, snatch and grab what we can in life in order to feed our babies and to keep ourselves alive. Um, it's a pretty grisly prospect for most people most of the time, and that's just a fact. The fact of the matter, we know that this world is um, predicated on three pillars, war, disease, and poverty. That's a fact. And some people, like myself, are very much luckier than others, to be sure. Um, the reason why I founded the New Earth uh, Project many years ago, and then slowly, with um, an ever revolving door of brilliant colleagues and um, friends and family, we've developed um, the project or the initiative into something very spectacular now. And we have a, our New Earth University with almost 26,000 registered students. Um, the Lazarus Initiative is, you know, was forged in through the work that we we do, the Arise Guerrilla News Network, and our uh, tap dancing and frontline activism is um, birthed also through that same metric of the New Earth Project. But the critical project itself is taking place um, as a an emerging template or blueprint for a full spectrum. Um, I don't like the word sustainability. I actually despise the word. Um, regeneration, the capacity for us to be regenerative at the cellular level and at the social, economic, and social ecological level. So what does that world look like? What does the new earth look like? Well, we're building that out right now in Bacala Laguna in Mexico. We are underway. The project is now fully underway. We're very excited about where this is taking us. And uh, we'll be making some very exciting announcements uh, very soon. And I believe I'm given a green light to make that, ex that, that those announcements in the course of June. Um, but we're going to be taking the New Earth Project beyond uh, simply um, our test bed in Bacala Laguna in Mexico. So the short clip I want to play for you and uh, Christy, you might from the green room give me a thumbs up or down, depending on whether or not you're able to watch this video play. I just want to um, give some of you, the audience, um, a chance to look in on the scope of the project that we've begun in Mexico. Anyone interested, uh, please reach out to us. Um, we've consolidated a formidable uh, team. And as I said, we're about to make some very exciting announcements in the next couple of weeks uh, connected to how this project is going to be springboarding elsewhere in the world. So um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, coming up uh, after this clip that I'm uh, about to play for you, um, we have Bioresonance, the next generation with Carolyn Mansfield and uh, my beloved friend Kim Kindersley, and then uh, Crystal Spiral, the Geometry of Ascension with George Leoniak and Dave Emery joining me for that. And then Igniting the Flame, Toltec, Wisdom and Prophecy with uh, Abuelo Ejecamitl and the um, wonderful translator Alejandro Cuesta. Uh, he's one of the greatest wisdom keepers on the planet. Um, and following that, Dakini Weaving, Keys to the Golden Age, um, a beautiful uh, conversation with Padma Kandro. So stand by, friends, uh, for that. And I'm going to see if I can spin this uh, short video on the New Earth Project. Okay, stand by.
Very good. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so to just round off the point I'm trying to underscore is that um, this was triggered really by what David Sarita was speaking to. Um, what we do to assure our biological ascension and to enjoy surfing reality is we lay claim to our lives. We claim our crown. We claim our thrones and we seat ourselves upon our throne and we crown ourselves upon that throne as the sons and daughters of God, which is to say the living men and women of the living soil. And we begin to forge and fashion lives um, worth living. So you step out of the willful um, servitude and enslavement that we've all been mind fucked and cult programmed into by taking the knee uh, to Caesar and rendering coin to Caesar and filling out Caesar's fucking forms with block black capital letters at every turn and rendering our signature unto Caesar so that Caesar and his Babylonian priest bankers uh, can monetize and securitize us at every turn. As David said, with mortgages and bank loans and credit cards and debt um, and so on and so forth, all of which is death spiral mechanics. So time out, what we're seeing uh, on the land in, in the, in the, in the um, uh, in international landscape of politicking and what have you and the high street is a collapse of Babylon. And, and we're going to suffer. We're going to hurt greatly, um, depending on the degree to which we continue to allow ourselves to be indentured into um, that Babylonian fantasia. And, and the fact is that now is the perfect time for us to step away from Sodom and Gomorrah, actually turn around and flee, uh, in my view, get out of the kill grid, remove yourself from the toxic kill grid and the death resonance um, that's assaulting all living systems now in cityscapes. Um, get back to the living soil and the New Earth Sanctuary Project in Bacala is building out many hundreds of homes. Um, we anticipate um, up to 750, uh, possibly more, um, in this blueprint project, which we'll be replicating elsewhere. As I said, well, the Mayan Riviera era for now is one of the fastest appreciating places in the world, which two years ago when I launched um, the countdown to the project, I did um, say that I think uh, I had chosen the best place in the world to build that blueprint. And despite the global financial calamity that's going on elsewhere around the world, 
uh, right now in Mexico, and certainly emphasis on the Mayan Riviera, it is skyrocketing the value. So uh, we did uh, divine and select that um, land appropriately, and the project is is moving ahead. It's it's a, a very exciting one because I believe it's going to be the world's full first spectrum zero point economy. That is the point to reduce the cost of everything to nothing and yet to live in a place of exquisite beauty where everything is bioresonant, everything is bioarchitected, and people are focused on the elevation of art, beauty, and consciousness above all things. That then leads to our spiritual enlightenment and our emancipation, and that leads to immortality at the biological level. Um, and the people who poo-poo the ideas um, that I've just espoused are people who are on the flip side of the spiral of ascension and are almost certainly bifurcating into space dust. Those folks who can understand uh, and affirm themselves as immortal spirits sufficiently and who recognize that this indeed is the perfect time um, that we incarnated our souls into in order to be the custodians and the stewards of biological ascension. So I'm quite unashamed in the language, um, and I'm going to get be leaning even harder into this language of um, so-called ascension as, um, as the days roll on. In any event, thank you all uh, for joining us on this open source uh, segment of, um, of the Lazarus Symposium. I believe the next short segment is also open source. Christy is going to trigger uh, from the green room that media which was pre-recorded. And I'll bid you all adieu. However, I will be in the green room uh, watching things and watching comments. So Christy, take it away. Thanks, friends.